Welcome to the Lawrence University Career Center podcast. I'm Kamara White, sitting in for Ty Collins, and today we're chatting with Sonia Downing. Downing is a current professor in the musicology department at Lawrence. Her research interests include Balinese gamelan music and dance, traditional music pedagogy, the intersection of gender and performance, and ethnomusicology. Let's get started. What is ethnomusicology? That's a great question. Um, and it's maybe surprisingly not always easily answered. Uh, my favorite definition of ethnomusicology is the study of people making music. Um, so I think of it as kind of a little bit in contrast to historical musicology, where you're going into archives and looking a lot at, at primary source documents from the past as a way into how people understood the music they were making or listening to. Um, uh, ethnomusicologists usually get to actually talk to people directly. Um, and so, so I like that definition because it puts the emphasis on the people themselves, um, which mm -hmm. is so much a part of our methodology interviewing people just like this, or also having informal conversations, um, hanging out with people, a lot of just hanging out time, but also taking lessons, um, observing rehearsals, playing along whenever you're invited to, if that's appropriate, um, going to performances and, and actually seeing all the live stuff. One thing I think that's good to point out is that Sometimes, and historically, this was more true that ethnomusicologists were mostly um, North Americans and Europeans going out into the rest of the world um, and studying non Western music and then coming back and writing that up for other Western folks. It has, it has really shaken up. I think it can stay to be further shaken up, um, but there are folks that are doing ethnomusicology on Western music, which is great. So taking a lot of these methods uh, and talking to current practitioners of, of Western music, whether that's folk music or popular music or, or even classical music or whatever. Um, so there, there are definitely, and have for decades been folks doing that. Um, there are also ethnomusicologists in parts of Africa, in Latin America, in places that historically have been the studied parts of the world, now there are ethnomusicologists there who are who are studying their own stuff, who are you know going elsewhere and studying. The difference there, it's not totally kind of an equitable situation because a lot of those countries, I'm thinking like there's a, a growing um, community of ethnomusicologists in academic institutions in Ghana, for example. Um, but those programs don't have the access to funding that, I mean, we're already scrabbling over scraps <laughs> in the, in the U.S. within the, you know, humanities, social sciences, um, and then folks in, a, in other like post-colonial countries, um, uh, yeah, don't even have necessarily access to, to the funding that, that we do. So, what did you major in during your undergrad and how did you end up pursuing a master's in ethnomusicology? I studied music and I majored in music. I minored in environmental studies. Um, I initially started out aiming to do a double degree in music and engineering <laughs> and engineering was the career path. <laughs> um, and um, I really, I really did love the, it was too much to do two degrees in four years. That, that was, it was crazy. That was their, the only option. There was no like five year. And so I, I kind of dropped the engineering stuff down just to do environmental engineering, which I loved. That was awesome. Um, and then I, I think of it as like music just didn't let me go. <laughs> um, my, I was, I played flute. Um, I had studied piano. I was perfectly happy studying Stravinsky and Debussy and music theory and medieval music and the whole thing. Um, and playing an orchestra, loved playing an orchestra. And I guess I was kind of thinking maybe music ed, something like that along those lines. Um, and then my sophomore year, I took a class called Music of Asia 
I had no idea what it was going to be about, but I was just really happy that it ticked a music elective. It might have been my junior year, a music elective, uh, you know, cultural diversity, like it checked a whole bunch of boxes. And I was like, I'm being so efficient. This is awesome. And the first, and I, yeah, that was all I cared about. And I was like, sweet, this is great. Um, the first day of class, the professor played recordings of Balinese gamelan, of Chinese opera, Japanese shakuhachi, all of these totally different sounds. And I remember by the end of class, we were all like white knuckled, like gripping our desks, just like, like it, not knowing how to even take in these sounds that we had never been exposed to ever. And by the end of the term, to be able to listen to particular structures, to be able to know how to listen and to how to begin to understand these musics that had been so totally foreign at the beginning um, was a process that I just really loved. Um, and so, yeah, I, I that it really grabbed me. Um, and then that professor, my senior year, was able to get funding together to get a set of Balinese gamelan instruments. Um, and so I joined the group my senior year and that was like, you know, totally fell in love with that. Uh, never would have expected, but it was because I'm, you know, I'm not a percussionist. Like what is this banging on things? And I don't, the, just the aesthetics of the music, the process of learning that there's no sheet music really challenged me. And I remember feeling like the process of learning these complex rhythms straight to memory, it was almost like a physical sensation in my brain, like of new like neural pathways, you know, being structured, like yeah. oh, new ways of, build, you know, of, of kind of building knowledge. And it was so hard and so awesome at the same time. Um, so that also really grabbed me. There were other students who were calling, I remember there were there were students who were who were like demand, you know, issuing demands to the faculty, like we need an ethnomusicology program. We need to get beyond our kind of Western limitations and everything. And and even though I was having so much fun doing all this, it it kind of the broader implications didn't really sink in for a while. And I was kind of looking at those students going like, cool, that's cool that you want to do that. Like I'm happy playing flute and orchestra and like whatever. I don't know. After I graduated, I really needed to not be in school for a while and like recover from college. <laughs> Understandable. And I went back home and just by serendipity that um, I live 20 minutes away from uh, a nonprofit arts organization dedicated to the study and performance of Balinese gamelan music. And my professor actually was like, well, if you're going home, you know, you got to check out this group. So I was like, all right. So I went to one of their workshops and they were like, oh, wait, you can actually already play. And I was like, yeah, I just wanted to come to the workshop, like whatever. And they were like, well, we've got some spots open if you want to kind of, you know, try out like being part of our group. And I was like, oh, yes, <laughs> more go on. Um, so I joined up with them, played with them for two years. Um, and then with that group, went on tour to Bali in, two, in 2000. It seems like so long ago now. Um <laughs> And that trip really, it had the, it, I had traveled to Europe before in high school on an exchange program. I had had the opportunity to travel a little bit outside the U.S., but never outside, you know, the Western world and first time in Asia and, um, and absolutely just loved everything about Bali. You live outdoors all the time. It's very easy to be vegetarian. I was vegetarian at the time. Just lots of like eggs and tofu and tempeh and it's great. There's just music and performing arts going on everywhere all the time. You can literally walk down the street and hear multiple rehearsals happening at any, practically at any given. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not even that much. Um Day when I are always so sad to come back to the U.S. after you know, like be walking down the street, like where's all the music? <laughs> um, so okay, so that really opened my eyes just to different ways of of living, just different kind of different you know familial structures, different social structures. Um, and I started already becoming really interested in gender issues at that point because it was the first time that I had experienced being a minority, which I wish that everyone could have a sense of this, right? And and having people make 
assumptions about the kind of person I was based on what I looked like, I started to really wonder what the lives were like of women in Bali um, and girls growing up in Bali, and especially those involved in the arts, because some aspects of performing arts are open to everyone. Anybody can be a dancer. But gamelan at that point was really mostly a male domain. Um, and I did know of a few women instrumentalists, but there weren't many. And so they didn't have many opportunities. And that just the, all of these questions started kind of coming up in my brain. But it hadn't totally, things hadn't coalesced. Uh, I was still playing flute a lot. Um, and I ended up actually going back to school and getting my master's, not in ethnomusicology, but in flute performance. Mm. So this was a, you know, many, many detours, <laughs> I guess, mm. or just a wavy, whatever, the, you know, paths aren't straight. <laughs> um, mm. So, so that was great. I studied with Jill Felber at UC Santa Barbara. She was awesome, had a great experience, gained a lot of um, I think gained a lot of skill, uh, gained a lot of self-knowledge as well, that I can work really hard at performance and do the thing, but I'm not super happy spending so many hours a day all by myself in a little practice room, yeah. not doing all the other, like I'm too multi-interested and I just didn't, I had a, it wasn't Jill, I had another teacher in between who I was studying with in San Francisco, who at one point said, Sonia, you're just not obsessive enough. And I was like, yeah, I'm not, because he really wanted me to like, you know, I was doing all these other things. I had a job, I was swimming. I was, you know, I don't even remember. I was whatever. I was all, I was playing gamelan and he wanted me to just like more hours every day. Anyway, so I did that for two years and then I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> okay. So another bit of serendipity, just again, by just, I don't know, sheer dumb luck. Thank you to the whoever forces that be. Um, UC Santa Barbara also has a really strong ethnomusicology program. Oh. And when I was taking my like required, you know, classical music performance practice classes and stuff and having to do research on Handel or whoever I was supposed to be researching, I would end up wandering to the back. <laughs> I would always like find myself in the far back corner of the library where I'll the really interesting books were on like, you know, field work in Zimbabwe and, you know, Peruvian Andean pan flutes and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is the stuff I want to be researching. Like, why can't I write a paper on this stuff? This is so cool. Um, and so then I finally started to like pay attention and listen, listen to these voices, right? Um, I took a, I took a class. I was able to somehow squish, squish into my schedule um, an ethnomusicology class or two just to kind of you know just I'm just curious about this kind of thing um so fun so just amazing um and uh got to know some of the ethnomusicology professors got to know some of the others yeah so anyway so it just I just felt a lot more affinity with the people and with the material and the content and everything um and so I was starting to think more seriously, like, oh, maybe I'll go into ethnomusicology eventually. And I was still thinking like, oh, I'll take some years off and work again and do other. Th I don't know. I don't know what was why what my hesitation was. Um, I guess it just seemed like a big, a big leap of faith. And anyway, it was actually my flute teacher who was like, what do you have to do that's so important that you have to do now rather than just continue on? and go in, you know, just kind of switch over, go into ethnomusicology. Yeah. And her point was, oh my gosh, you'll be so marketable because you have a background in both Western classical music performance and then ethnomusicology, you can kind of, you know, whatever, do it all, right? Yeah. Um, and I talked with, I remember having a, a good long conversation with Scott Marcus, who was um, another ethnomusicology professor. And he kind of sat me down and was like, all right, you're thinking about this. This is the timeline these are the opportunities. These are the potential drawbacks, right? You're going to go into debt. It's going to be, it's going to, you know, it's going to take you a good, however many years, these are the hurdles, right? These are all the kind of the steps along the way in grad school, you know, just take a bunch of classes and then poof, you're done. 
you have to, right, you have qualifying exams, you have to figure out your research topic, you have to get all these things approved, you have to be applying for grants because we don't have funding to cover, you know, everyone and all that yeah. stuff. Kind of laid everything out and I was like, yeah, okay, that, that all sounds doable, which now it's like, what? But I don't know, I was up for it, I guess. Um, and they were awesome. The, the ethnomusicology faculty um, said, we will count your master's degree so you can come in, you'll have to start at the beginning of the graduate courses, but you can skip over writing a master's thesis because you already have the master's degree. Yeah, that was awesome. Because I was oh looking into applying to a bunch of other schools just to see, you know, different options. And all the other ones, they were like, oh, no, you'll have to write a master's thesis. And I was like, no, no. So just one. Bad. Just I just want to write one big thing. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I was like, wow, I love both of these, but I have to pick one, like, wow. Mm. And so I decided, okay, I've been to Bali once, maybe I'll go to India, like scrounge up, you know, work during the summers, make some money, save up for a plane ticket and whatever, and try and go. Um, and I was planning, planning this, I was talking to people, making some contacts. I was actually, this is really the crazy thing. I went to a concert Oh, it must have been when I was doing more flute stuff, but I went to an Indian music concert. It was actually a vocalist. This woman had the most captivating voice. Everything she did, I was just like, oh my gosh, I want to do what she's doing. I'm not a vocalist. I sang in choirs, choruses, that's it. And this woman made me want to be a singer, which is like again crazy to me um and so I talked to her after the, the concert was like three and a half hours and I was like you're done already keep going <laughs> um talked to her afterward and I was like can I like come and visit you and study <laughs> study with you and she was like yeah absolutely I have you know I do teach lessons like you know whatever we yeah. change contact information and and she was like yeah but you can whatever stay with my cousin's family I don't know she was like all ready to kind of help me figure it all out my mom was freaking out. She was like, you're just going to get off the plane in India and like, and go be somewhere. <laughs> right. Like, which now, you know, like, yeah, that's, that sounds like a mom thing. To but me, I was, so. you know, in my early twenties and I was like, yeah, this is, this is going to be amazing. Um, I had, I had applied for a visa. I had it in my passport. Mm -hmm. I was starting to look at flights and so this was 2002, India and Pakistan started like testing nuclear weapons at each other kind of thing. Like there, it, mm. um, there was a lot of tension at that. I mean, it always like kind of goes up and down, but there was a lot of tension at that point to the point where the U S started pulling, um, staff out of their embassies in India, which like, that's a bad sign when like they start, you know, pulling like U S employees out and my, yeah. At that point I was like, okay, I can't do this to my mom. And also they might not even let me in in the first place. Um, so yeah. So I was like, well, that sucks. I still want to go somewhere. Now I have all this money saved up for a trip. I guess I'll go back to Bali. <laughs> so I contacted a teacher that I had no, you know, like went through my contacts that way and was just like, Hey, can I stay with you? And no, no, no. And, um, yeah, and set things up and and went back to Bali for a couple of months. Um and and that pretty much yeah, clinched it. Then I was like, yes, this is amazing. This is awesome. There's so much I could, you know, possibly do. I already had then I was developing possible topics and that sort of thing and um so I'm still India is still on my bucket list. I still want to go. It'll happen. It's been decades. <laughs> what places you has your career taken you? Which you've already answered basically. Oh, and okay. how did you end up teaching at Lawrence? That's a question. Oh, sure. And then um, there's yeah. what advice would you give students who are interested in pursuing um, ethnomusicology? Um, how I wound up at Lawrence, I can make that short. Um, I was on the job market when I was finishing up my degree in 2008. Um, there were not a whole lot of jobs in the first place. Uh, and I interviewed, I got interviews at a couple of, two or three other places. Um, and in the midst of those, I happened to check the listings. And then I saw this one for Lawrence. I had to look Lawrence up on the map. And I was like, it's practically Canada. Like really only 
had experience on the coasts. Anyway, um, but I was like, oh, but it's a small liberal arts school. That's awesome. I definitely, having been to a small liberal arts school and then for undergrad and then a big school for graduate school, mm-hmm. really saw the benefits of being at a small school and the liberal mm-hmm. arts in general and liberal arts education. And I, I, it just looked like pretty awesome. It was actually a, a two-year postdoc position. And Julie McQuinn interviewed me. And I guess we got along well and she decided that I would be okay. And so it's thanks to Julie that, that I got that initial first two years. And then I was like, this place is amazing. I had no idea. I thought I would just be like toughing it out in the tundra for two years. (laughs) Um, And then Brian Pirtle started that same year and he was awesome. And he was so supportive of us starting up a gamelan. And he's always been such a great supporter of, of Dewa and the Gamelan and everything. And it, it just fit. And so kind of mutually, you know, I was like, yeah, if there is a way to stay. And he was like, oh, I'll try to, you know, he, he kind of convinced the, the president at the time to, um, to create a tenure track position in, in ethnomusicology. Mm-hmm. So advice for students. Yeah. Uh, it's very rare for schools to offer ethnomusicology majors at the undergraduate level. So students should not worry if they're interested in ethnomusicology, but you know, we don't have a major. They they wouldn't even necessarily be required to do a student design major, although they certainly could. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say take uh take as many musicology classes here as possible. Um, take a cultural anthropology class if they can get in. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they are, if students are considering, are interested in ethnomusicology, if they are a junior or senior, usually the anth department does not let older, like, you know, uh, juniors and seniors take the intro to cultural anthropology class. But if you talk to the instructor, talk to the chair and say, I'm really interested in ethnomusicology and Professor Downing wants me to take this class, they might, they might make an exception. So yeah, cultural anthropology, Ethnic studies uh, courses would also be really excellent. Any any ethnic studies class, basically having, yeah, having music experience, but also experience with all of the kind of cultural context issues, social dynamics, power dynamics, these mm-hmm. sorts of things. Um, anything that has to do with identity, even a gender studies course would be awesome, right? Just thinking about about identity and social relations. Um, and how kind of politics broadly understood, right? Power dynamics kind of intersects with a lot of this. I know ethnomusicologists who have come from a number of different fields. So there's many, many paths to ethnomusicology. I have a friend who studied folklore, um, another friend who came actually from studying English literature, a number of friends who studied um music performance or, you know, classical music, another friend who actually came from anthropology and then wanted to get more into music. So there are, there are many paths and there are many different types of programs out there in terms of grad school. So some focus exclusively on ethnomusicology, some you actually do a combination of ethno and historical musicology. Mm -hmm. Some are very social theory focused um, some are much more performance based. You play in lots of different ensembles every term. Yeah, so there's lots of ways to do it. I just think it's something that people learn a lot about within the musicology classes. And then after that, it kind of just, there's a lot of people who were like you that like had really strong interest in them, but didn't have like a set person to like tell them you can actually do this. Mm-hmm. So, and I know a lot of people after taking, the, especially the intro classes, are a lot more interested in potentially mastering in it. I nice. thought it was funny when you talked about how it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of debt. It's true. It's true. And I have colleagues, well, I have colleagues that kind of are in the humanities, you know, everywhere who who are very hesitant to to recommend grad school to their students because it's rough. But there are there are a few programs in ethnomusicology around the country where you can't they will give you a a full ride essentially so if you get in they will support you financially um I took a I did a combination of loans and TAing so I got Mm. some some help from TAing um and then great experience for sure and I figured okay my parents at the time actually they were super 
supportive. They were like, you know, school loans are the best debt that you can have. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, you know, it depends. Um, I have friends and colleagues who worked all the way through. I, I, I tried to do some jobs. Actually, I attempt a couple, a few times, you know, here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped financially as well. But I also knew that if I had a bigger job, I would never finish. So I was like, I will take on the debt and just like plow through. Yeah. Um, but again, there's lots of ways, you know, there's lots of ways to do it. So there's a lot of articles about how to pursue music in grad school, but not mm -hmm. a lot about grad school in general. Well, at least for like more humanity based things like grad school for what are they like STEM is a bit more straightforward, I would say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Just because there's been a lot more pathways for that and a lot of more schools have funding for that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I'm happy to, I mean, if you or anyone else is is really interested, I'm happy to, yeah, to pass on resources or names of schools that that do have, you know, good funding opportunities or mm -hmm. other, yeah, colleagues to, to talk to. I mean, students can always, you know, just look up programs on <laughs> online and reach yes. out to faculty and just say, hey have these questions is it possible to get funding how long does the funding last what how long does it typically get through your program mm -hmm. well thank you very much professor downey you're so welcome <laughs> <laughs>